warm welcome to African Aerospace and Defence TV. In many parts of the world, arms procurement has become synonymous with corruption. South Africans themselves are still looking for answers into what went wrong in the 1999 arms deal. Andre Rue, a senior researcher at the Institute for Security Studies, explains why it's so crucial to have appropriate measures in place to ensure transparency. Why is it so critical for us to have closure on this uh, very controversial arms deal? I think the most important thing is to bring in the checks and balances because uh, arms deal procurement will always be with us. And around the world, there has been a lot of corruption in national arms deal procurement systems. Um, we saw in, in India, they've had massive problems for a number of years. And the major multinational arms dealers, that uh, whether it's BAE um, or Tyson Krupp, but these companies actually have had to work with the environment that they want to sell these weapons in. And if the environment has an element of corruption, then to do business, it, is, it actually became an international trend that uh, you need to put sweeteners on the table for certain individuals. And this is plain and simple corruption. So it becomes an expectation as well. Oh, that's right. Um, and in, in fact, we, in Germany, for instance, with our Corvette purchase, uh, Tyson Krupp, uh, were, who, who were the suppliers of the ships, um, they were subject to regulations in Germany which allowed them to pay bribes. It was not illegal to pay a bribe. All you have to do is declare it for tax purposes. Mm -hmm. So this is the, um, the level at which this international support for corruption has developed. And on a national level, where our concern comes in is that corruption affects the quality of what you're purchasing. So how do we stop the corruption? What kind of intervention is needed? I think a great deal of progress has been made with um, the procurement agency within the Defence Force environment in that checks and balances have been brought in. There is a more open process in terms of um, the tender process. The challenge, however, remains that any system will be open to manipulation, to influence on the highest level where decisions are made. So you may have now a more technical process on the operational level that looks at the quality of what you're getting in each of the proposals for a weapons package. The final decision, though, is always influenced by politics. South Africa, for instance, will not buy American aircraft, mm -hmm. F-16s or uh, Super Hornets, despite the capabilities because of the political reluctance to be dependent on America for source codes for the software for the avionics on the aircraft, for instance. So this is why we went and bought the Gripen, because it's a neutral aircraft uh, in terms of coming from Sweden. Um, and how far that political influence is pushed to favor a certain package, this is where now corruption and influence comes in. Political influence will always be there to favor national arms industries. Um, where it comes to individuals now, this is where the corruption issues are, are mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in discussion. What are the spillover effects out of this arms deal for local industry players? Well, there are many challenges. One, the perception of corruption, um, but also there are, with the checks and balances that have come in, and, a, and a, a primary role play is the National Arms Control Committee. So companies like Paramount, which are massive international players with military equipment, um, have problems selling their equipment overseas. Uh, the recent Nigeria incident where Nigeria sought with their challenge of Boko Haram and trying to capacitate the Defence Force to purchase some military equipment in South Africa. And despite having uh, political favour from this from the highest levels of government and a legitimate commercial deal, it was still cut off at the National Arms Control Committee because it didn't go through the right technical process. So this impacts and affects the ability of, of our uh, dwindling arms industry to be effective in terms of their sales on the international market. 
The former Kiss 209 helicopter first started cruising South African skies earlier this year as a light training helicopter. But from what we hear, there's interest for it to be used for a variety of purposes. The Italian designed and manufactured Pharma K209 helicopter has arrived in the African skies. This mainly carbon fiber machine could revolutionize helicopter pilot training on the continent. The K209 sports the latest technology. The Pharma K209 is uh, an all composite uh, carbon fiber constructed helicopter with a turbine engine and a full EFIS glass cockpit, which is very unique in the light helicopter industry. The systems you find in this helicopter are generally reserved for bigger machines, um, more expensive helicopters. Normally, we charge about 3,000 Rand to train on an R22. The cheapest turbine trainer would be a Jet Ranger at about eight to 10,000 Rand. So it's that substantial jump that makes it so special. Now you can train for normal, low cost rates with a turbine. This machine makes direct progress to turbine rating for student pilots possible. This machine, I think, will make a significant difference to flying schools within the world for that matter. But in our case, in Southern Africa, learning to fly a turbine-powered helicopter is hugely expensive. In this case, it is not. This makes it attractive to people that want to learn to fly and they will have turbine-powered experience in their logbook to enhance their careers in the future. This machine, for example, has very strong pedal authority, which means you have to be extra sensitive on the pedals as compared to other helicopters. So that will make the students work a little bit harder. Other things like the turbine has a bit of a lag. So a piston helicopter, like a car, as soon as you touch the throttle, there's revs. With the turbine, it needs to spool up first. So it's small things that the student will have to also bear in mind when flying, which we could say maybe makes it a little bit more difficult to fly but in his career 90 percent of his real jobs are going to be on turbine machines and he's going to need to deal with those factors anyway i chose the the farmer because it's the the cheapest helicopter thus far in south africa and although it's non-type certified the hours uh, do count and uh, for your commercial turbine time and so i need the turbine hours to progress further up the ladder but how does it perform the machine has quite a lot of performance in comparison with an R22 for example. First reason being it's lighter and has more power. So out here in South Africa where you can see it's very hot and we're quite high, the air is very thin, it helps us like that. We still obviously have our limitations like any aircraft in these conditions but we do perform a lot better. I would definitely recommend the helicopter because uh, there is still some, some things to, to sort out but Otherwise, it's quite a nice helicopter to fly. It's just not very ideal for hot temperatures like today and, and high altitudes, but further down, lower altitude, it would be just fine. The fixed undercarriage version costs about two and a half million rand and the operating costs are around 700 rand an hour. For those in Africa eager to own one of these flying babinos, the good news is that there's an assembly facility in South Africa. Your standard maintenance, your regular, your scheduled maintenance on the helicopters is, is, is very little to be done. Unfortunately for the maintenance companies, uh, fortunately for the owners, the, uh, they're very, very simple to maintain. Um, they're not technically involved. Um, they, generally it's going to be a good machine for, for owners and not for maintenance companies because the owners are going to save a lot of money on them. Currently, three more K209s are being assembled in South Africa. Keeping it stupidly simple, as the father of the K209, Nino Farmer, would say, the race is on in the African skies for being the light training helicopter of choice. Marisa de Klerk, AAD TV. This helicopter is quite unique. It's the first of its kind in Africa, predominantly made of carbon fiber. In fact, it's proved to be quite a mission to have it registered in South Africa. 
To tell us more about registering and declaring this unique helicopter airworthy in South Africa, we are talking to the South African Civil Aviation Authority's Senior Manager for Aircraft Certification, Shubash Devkaran. Welcome, Shubas. Good morning, Marisa. Shubas, um, as I understood from the owner, this helicopter was not even on the databases of the South African Civil Aviation Authority when they tried to register that. How is this possible? How, what, what happened there? As you may probably be aware, aviation is quite a highly regulated um, air sector in, in transportation. In fact, it's a most um, stringently regulated sector for obvious reasons. Um, and, and for that reason, we have in place very stringent regulations governing any new type of helicopter or aircraft coming into South Africa. And as the South African Civil Aviation Authority, we pride ourselves on maintaining the highest levels of aviation safety internationally. It is our goal. We value the citizens of the country, and in that regard, we enforce the highest levels of compliance. In terms of the acceptance process and the registration process of any new type of aircraft, there are a number of requirements which, which need to be met. For this particular helicopter, the Farmer K209, what we have observed is that it is an Italian uh, kit-built uh, helicopter. It is manufactured, or rather the kit is manufactured in Italy, and it could be assembled by an amateur builder anywhere in the world. And in this case, it was assembled in, in South Africa. The assessment process leading up to that determination involves a number of documentation and assessments, and of course, to maintain the high levels of safety, a thorough review is necessary. Now, you then had to, I guess, start a process to get it onto the computer system. Did you need to design a new category, new standards to test this computer, uh, this helicopter against? Marisa, this particular helicopter does have uh, a number of innovative features. Um, however, our systems are geared up to cater for any new type of helicopter or aircraft coming into the country. So in this regard, we look at our aircraft registration system. It's completely accommodating, as well as our pilot licensing system. What is perhaps uh, a requirement in this instance is because it's a new type of aircraft on, on the register, we would require pilot training but, uh, performed by the, by the manufacturing facility. This is obviously to ensure that the pilots who perform or, or train the South African pilots actually meet the necessary standards. And of course, the, the manufacturer of the aircraft would know best in this regard. When it actually came to flying the aircraft with a qualified pi South African-based pilot. There apparently was no pilot in South Africa. How did you overcome that challenge in order to get the aircraft or the helicopter declared airworthy and legal in South mm -hmm. Africa? In fact, that's, that's quite a pertinent question. Um, one of the challenges which every state such as South Africa is faced with when importing a new type of aircraft into the country, such as the Pharma K209, is who is going to fly this helicopter or who is going to fly, fly this aircraft. Um, and especially in terms of that particular person meeting the requirements as it's prescribed within our regulations. And there are a number of technical requirements in terms of experience and formal qualifications. However, we accommodate such um, requests from applicants through means of an exemption process where for this first type of aircraft, one may not have the relevant experience. However, they have experience in a similar category or type of aircraft, um, such as uh, R44 Robinson or R66, as an example. And using that base of experience, together with the instructor's qualification, we grant an exemption so that they are able to undertake the factory training at the manufacturing facility be granted a rating in South Africa where after they are able to uh, undertake this training for other South African citizens without those citizens physically going to the factory themselves. Mm -hmm. This is a very formal and, 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 and technical process in which we, we perform a safety assessment of the exemption application to ensure that of course safety is not compromised 
Yeah. And um, now finally, the aircraft is registered. What kind of registration does it have and what does this now mean? So this, this particular type of helicopter um, is categorized currently as an amateur built aircraft. And this is because the manufacturing facility, which is based in Italy, produces kits. And this is perhaps very, uh, a, a very positive uh, factor in this case, mm -hmm. in that the manufacturing facility which produces these kits releases these kits to kit builders all around the world. And it's true also in South Africa that a kit builder could then assemble this aircraft and apply for registration as well as an authority to fly to perform his own recreational purposes or, or, or uses rather. Um, and further, if the, the, the applicant in question wishes to pursue the, the certification processes so that he could utilize the aircraft for more commercial operations, that is certainly a possibility and we have processes in place. However, the requirements are a lot more stringent in that regard. That's it for this week's edition. Stay tuned every week to this channel. Tap into our other sections for more coverage. See you soon.